right, good afternoon, everyone. We apologize for the little bit of the delay we had getting started here, but thank you so much for joining us on January's Ohio Health Modernization Movement webinar. Today, we will be talking about HIV criminalization and the trans community, a care package. Very briefly, I do just want to introduce myself. My name is Dobie Peach. I will be one of the moderators for today's webinars. I use she, her pronouns. And I do want to also talk about the mission of the Ohio Health Modernization Movement. The Ohio Health Modernization Movement is a coalition of organizations and individuals dedicated to ending the criminalization of HIV in Ohio. Our mission is to mobilize a broad coalition, including individuals and communities who are disproportionately impacted by HIV to replace fear-based stigmatizing laws that criminalize HIV status with evidence-based non-discriminatory laws that protect public health. With that said, we have an awesome lineup of speakers today. So I'm going to do a brief introduction for a few of them. There's a couple of folks we don't have biographies for, but I do first things first want to introduce Miss Angie, one of our panelists today. Miss Angie uses she, her pronouns. She is a mother, a granny, a drag entertainer, a trans activist, a volunteer for Mosaic Street Worker Project. She enjoys bingo, casinos, and she loves cooking. I like listening and watching oldie but goody music and videos, but most of all, she enjoys spending time with her husband of almost 30 years. Kim Burroughs will also be joining us today. Kim Burroughs uses she, her pronouns. She is a staff attorney in the Equality Ohio Legal Clinic. She graduated from the Ohio State University College of Law in 2016. Prior to joining Equality Ohio, Kim worked primarily in the field of criminal law. She began her career as an assistant prosecuting attorney in Delaware County, and then worked as a criminal staff attorney in the Delaware County Common Pleas Court. Kim is passionate about working with the LGBT community and strives to provide trauma-informed services to clients. Ms. McKayla Robinson is joining us as well. McKayla resides in Columbus, Ohio. They are 34 years of age, a graduate of Avita Institute with a certification as a managing cosmetologist. Currently employed with the Mosaic program as a prevention specialist through Equitas Health, where they were recently promoted to a trans health navigator. Within this position, they are out in the community testing and providing linkage care. They are also responsible for ensuring that people living with HIV are able to access and maintain care. They've also done many shows and benefits that have raised funds and awareness for the fight against HIV AIDS, along with efforts to help other LGBTQIA organizations. She is a positive force with a positive attitude and a great smile, Miss Gay Ohio 2018 forever. Also joining us is James Knapp, who was born and raised in Northeastern Ohio. More than just an attorney, James is also an advocate, an award-winning activist, a published author, an educator, and an active member of his local communities. James is currently chair and executive director of Trans Ohio, which is Ohio's first and largest transgender equality group. Founded in 2005, Trans Ohio provides education, advocacy, support, and community to the transgender, non-binary, and allied communities across Ohio. James has a Bachelor of Arts in English and Philosophy from the University of Akron and is Juris Doctor from Western Michigan. Before we get going with today's presentation, I do want to also just say a couple of notes as well today. And I see that Kim just dropped this in the chat as well. We will be posting the link to complete the quiz and evaluation for continuing education units at the end. Be sure that if you do desire CEUs, that you do list your name and license number in the quiz and evaluation at the end. We'll be posting that link at about 12.58, so just before we wrap things up at one. And I do also want to briefly provide a trigger warning today. We will be discussing some deeply personal stories. We'll be discussing transphobia and abuse at the hands of law enforcement. So please, especially to other trans folks on the call today, be sure that you're, you're taking care of yourselves as appropriate. If you need to step away, we completely understand. So with all of that said, I am going to change things over to James Knapp and, and Miss Francesca for the first part of our presentation th this afternoon. 
Morning, folks. Uh, my name is James. First, I want to say that this is your chance to ask questions. So if you do have questions as we're speaking, go ahead and write in the chat. Um, after the presentation, I'm available by email, or you can reach out to Kim with questions, but please do not reach out to panelists on Facebook or other means and ask them questions. This is the time now. Um, and I do want to stress that there really aren't any dumb questions. Believe me, I have heard everything. So um, if you have a question, please don't be embarrassed. Just type it in the chat and, and we'll get to you. Um, but I also want to start with just some basic definitions. I know everyone's heard transgender is an umbrella term and then everyone sort of gets lost under the umbrella and it gets very confusing. So just so we're on the same page because I know that trans competency can kind of vary depending on where you are in the state, what kind of work you're doing and who you know. Um, let's start with sex. Sex is a physical characteristic. Um, it's a classification. It's usually male or female. It's primarily based on a cursory examination of physical genitalia, but it's not based on any one criteria like genitals, chromosomes, hormones, fertility, that kind of thing. So when you hear things like there are only two sexes, I'm not really going to get into the politics at all, but that biologically that is false. Um, sex assigned at birth is basically just what it sounds like. When you come into the world, the doctor takes a quick glance at your external genitalia and says, it's a boy, it's a girl, and that's what goes on your birth certificate. That's what your sex assigned at birth is. Now, cisgender, uh, think of cis as same. If you're cisgender, you still identify as your sex as assigned at birth. What does transgender mean then? Easy, it means not cisgender. Does that make sense? Yes, awesome. I also want to uh, just really quickly go over transgender is not um, a noun, it is an adjective. So when you're talking about transgender people and the transgender community, you don't say a transgender or transgenders. Um, I know a lot of people in the queer community make jokes like, oh, the gays, oh, the transgenders. That's not a joke that uh, cisgender allies should be making because um, really we're, we're making fun of people misunderstanding the word. So please don't say a transgender, please don't say the transgenders, and for, for goodness sakes, don't say transgendering, as in someone is transgendering from one gender to another. That's, that's not the phrase, it's transitioning. Right, go ahead, Fran Francesca. Good morning, everybody. I hope you can all see me, but um, sorry, I have to use my cell phone. My computer is not working today, um, but I will just give you a brief bio. Um, back in 1999, I was carjacked, raped. I was infected with HIV. So I've been living with HIV for 21 years as of last year. Um, I will say this, at, at the hands of, of a law, law enforcement, when I was asking for a rape kit, all, all of that, I was told I basically de deserved a rape for, for, for trying to be a woman and performing drag at the time. But I will second James on, the, on, on this issue of, of, if you have a question, please ask me now. Do, do not reach out to me on my social media. Um, I'm, I'm a person who, likes boundaries and has learned to establish boundaries as far as being trans. So, um, yes, um, I did transition. I did have a surgery in 2019 for gender affirmation surgery, which for HIV positive and in individuals identifying as trans, um, as far as 10, 10 years back, um, could not have been and performed if if you were HIV positive. Um, so I I do identify as as a as a post op trans woman. There there are ways people identify in this community, but saying transgenders or transgendered, I I I. I'm always in a period of transition, I believe. I believe all of us are transitioning within learning whatever. However, it's, it's not appropriate to say transgender, transgenders, um, transgendering. Tra transitioning may be 
a better word to use. However, yes, that's how I feel about it. Um, I will say it's very scary living as an HIV positive um, trans woman. I rarely go anywhere by myself because of the fear of being mistaken. I could be shot. I could lose my life much more easily as, as a trans woman I mean, and identifying as, as a trans woman living with HIV going out in public by myself, not, not knowing if I'll, if, if I should return, if, if I were to be arrested now, I will say again, as a, as a white trans woman, I, I, I most likely would not face the oppression that, that my sisters and brothers of color face as, as a trans person, person and, and their severity would be very much more severe than mine. And how, however, I would still experience prejudice and bias from law, for, for, from law enforcement, as as I have in the past. I'm I'm not discounting the um, s significance of the of the color barrier and how it how it plays in. I know it plays in and and I like to say I have some relatable experiences with my brothers and sisters of color alert and and it does not make us equal. It just makes us a lot more re relatable to share those experiences. I I hope that came out well. Yeah, and there's a real problem with a lack of trans competency, not just with law enforcement, but, you know, even doing this work with, um, you know, working with the HIV positive population. And uh, I do want to give a hat tip to Equitas Health, because back when it was ARC, um, they had some forms that, you know, I, I continue to see this problem. They have either incomplete or incorrect forms that even when you go to get your HIV test, some trans folks, they don't even know which boxes to click. And it's not even a matter of, you know, um, selecting which gender, like um, the forms are, are a lot better. It used to just say male or female, and then are you interested in men and women, and that's it. And it didn't discuss what kinds of sex re related activities you were engaged in. Um, it didn't account for any genders outside of male or female. So for, for someone who is a trans man who is straight, for example, they wouldn't even know what, what box to click. And I think that really goes into uh, another important point that the studies are just, <laughs> we need more studies, we need more accurate studies because so many HIV studies just lump trans women in with cis gay men and either don't count trans men at all or count them as cis women. And they don't take into account that there are different um, risk factors and they change over time depending on whether or not you're on hormones, how long you've been on hormones and the kind of sex you're having. And when we do these HIV um, and living with HIV studies, there's, there's no accounting for that. It's either, you know, you are a man or you're a woman, or sometimes they do say gay men and slash trans women. And that it, that's just not accurate. May I jump in here, James? Absolutely. One thing I would like to say in doing accurate um, accounting of our population, please do, do not discount um, or, or group men who have sex with trans women are not the same as men who have sex with men. Now, I will say this, a man can, can have a dual identity and be a man who has sex with men and also identify as a man who has sex with trans women. We, we are not counting our trans amorous men and we're not counting our, I'm trying to figure out the word, are, are women who are trans amorous, are cisgender trans, are cisgender women who are trans amorous for trans men. We often group those as women who are, who are lesbian. All right, thank you both for starting us off today.
We do have um, one quick question, but we're actually going to go and save that for the end. So the next part of our presentation team, Michaela and I will be discussing some of the barriers to care, the trans folks face. James already started the conversation a little bit with the mention of some of the struggles that we see in the study. So Michaela, go and start us off and I'll, I'll jump in. All right. Well, good, um, good afternoon to everyone. My name is Michaela Robinson. Um, I use all pronouns. Um, I would say when it comes to care, I do believe some of the barriers that are um, around and that many people face is when you are transgender, um, non-binary, non-conforming, sometimes your care providers, they sometimes lack the true understanding on how to really address the issues that you may come into and present with them. Um, sometimes there's a lack of resources to actually make benefit for those who are in need of certain um, Certain resources, I know housing is one of the biggest issues that we tend to see when it comes to our trans community where it faces to where it's very, very hard to um, get housing. And also when it comes to employment. And I think some of the biggest things as in case management to where it can be helpful is if there was more resources and links to uh, figure out the best places to send trans folks to be able to apply and be able to get the proper care and the proper respect. I think also when it comes to dealing with people in housing, what has to happen is just the respect level from day one to not sexualize the client and to not sexualize the potential um, potential new tenant and just make sure that you're being respectful in all ways and all possibilities. I do believe there's a lot of issues when it comes to just un also understanding that sometimes you're not going to have a client who's easily want to speak freely about everything. It, sometimes it will take a little bit of time and you have to build a trust factor and you have to build a respect because it has been so many issues when it comes to the medical field, when it comes to trans persons and how they are, res and how they are respected when it comes to the medical field. A lot of people have been very um, disrespectful in a sense of starting from day one, like when you walk in, go to the reception desk, that messes up a lot of the issues because if you're not respected from the, the jump, and then if you don't also see yourself being represented in the advertisement or in the posters or anything that's around, it, it makes it feel like you're not welcome in the space. I know um, a lot of people do get a lot of health care through Equitas Health, and there's been a lot of work on making sure that there's a lot of representation being seen and visible in everything that is put out in the community. I know there's a lot of other places that people do frequent and go to. Um, I know as someone who works in dealing with case management in a sense, I feel like the best thing that you can do is just sit and try to build a general real relationship with the client um, and really just trying to figure out how to help and get someone where they are. You have to meet the client where they are. I know when I got my diagnosis in 06, um, one of the biggest things that kept being thrown at me was like, you need to start medicine. You need to do this. You need to do that. But mentally, it took a while for me to even accept my diagnosis. Um, it took a while for me to get comfortable in understanding. Um, it took a while for me to even be open enough to even talk to my medical team about the issues that I was battling and facing because at that point in time, it wasn't that my health wasn't my main concern, but I didn't have housing. I didn't have health care. I wasn't out to my family about a lot of things and stuff or whatever. So it was, I had to work through that first before I could get to that point. And I didn't disclose to my family until about 2012. And that was after figuring out that it was about that time for me to start medicine. And I needed that extra support and that extra care from family and friends to help make sure that I can make it through my journey. And amazingly, uh, been able to be undetectable for the past eight years. Um, it's been a great uh, thing to be a face and a representation for people within the community. I just live, I try to live authentically and just be able to press forward and to allow people to know that it's okay to accept your trials and tribulations, it's okay to step who you are. Everyone's life is pre-written, so it, it takes some time for us to figure out our life journey. And then I know in the medical field, and sometimes when you have your therapists and your counselors, a lot of people are trying to help you. But at the same point in time, it is a journey where you have to figure that out on your own. But I just, I, my biggest thing is in the future, what I'm hoping for when it comes to case management is that there are more resources that are beneficial to our trans community or non-binary and non-conforming, especially with our youth and young people, and also just in general, um, all ages, because there's caps and age caps and a lot of things, but we're all in need of support and help.
lost my mouth there for a second. I'm so sorry. Thank you so much for sharing, Michaela. Thank you. Um, there's just a couple of things that I want to add from my perspective. I, like I mentioned at the beginning, I work at Caracol as a health educator. And I will say from my very personal perspective, I'm a white trans lady from a really tiny town in Southern Illinois. I am not living with HIV. So I'm so glad that we have other folks on here that are willing to share their personal journeys and personal stories. I do want to mention a couple of other barriers to care that I see come up frequently with some of my trans friends and my trans clients. My, and I do want to add as well, going back to some of our discussion about studies and language, we still see, and, and me as a tester at Caracol, there's still no box for folks that are intersex. My, my partner is intersex and I would not be able to check that on the Ohio Department of Health testing form. So we still have a long way to go in improving some of our language. I did drop a couple of links in the chat as well. I know some folks were looking for some specific resources and I dropped a couple of links and Kim and I will be sure to share those tomorrow as well. I do want to also mention that one of the, one of the common misconceptions that I hear among other trans folks and both my clients and my friends is that they're concerned that PrEP may interfere with their hormones or hormone replacement therapy may interfere with PrEP. For those of you that aren't super, super familiar, PrEP is pre-exposure prophylaxis. The really easy way to explain it is it's like birth control, but it's for HIV. So it's a once a day pill that folks at risk for HIV can take. And as long as they're taking that once a day pill, they have a significant, significant de degree of protection against acquiring HIV through sexual contact and through injection drug use. The protection for injection drug use is a little bit lower than the, um, than the protection PrEP provides for sexual contact, but it's still very significant. Either way, I, I often hear from trans friends and my trans clients that they're concerned that PrEP may either lessen the effect of their hormones or there may be some medical interaction between them. Luckily, there have been a number of studies on this, still not nearly enough, we still need more, but there have been a number of studies on this that have shown that there is no interaction between PrEP and hormones with one exception. Oftentimes, this isn't approved by the Food and Drug Administration in the United States, but a lot of folks have moved towards uh, an on-demand dosing of PrEP, or what's often referred to as um, 211 dosing of PrEP. There have been some studies that hormone replacement therapy may slightly lessen the effectiveness of, uh, of PrEP used in that dosage. So I do just want to point that out. It's been, uh, to the best of my knowledge, I believe it's literally been one study that showed that, but I do just want to point that out. I do also want to briefly talk about some of the epidemiolo epidemiological side of things as well. That's a fun word to say on a Tuesday afternoon. Somewhere around 20, 28% of trans women, all trans women are living with HIV. However, thanks to the racist white supremacist society, society that we live in, the proportion of black transgender women that are living with HIV is much, much higher. Some estimates are up to 56%, but the main estimates that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention have been going with lately have been somewhere around 44%. So with all of that said, there are a significant number of barriers, both on the epidemiological side from um, what we refer to as social determinants of health that impact trans folks, along with some very real medical concerns, some interactions between hormone replacement therapy. Um, one of the other things as well that I do want to point out, in addition to sexual contact, which we talk about all the time as it relates to HIV, trans folks are at risk for contracting HIV through injection drug use, whether it be prescription drugs, so hormones, or it be illicit recreational drugs. Many trans folks take hormones through what's called an intramuscular route, which may put them at risk of sharing syringes with somebody else, 
or otherwise not having access to clean syringes, putting them at risk for uh, bacterial and fungal infections in addition to HIV and hepatitis C. So I do want to emphasize for any of our harm reductionists on the call, I know we have about 80 attendees today, which is amazing. So maybe we uh, have a few harm reductionists on the call today, so it is so important to make sure that we're including trans folks within our harm reduction programming and recognizing the unique needs that we have. So we may need different gauges and needles. We need to be respected in the programs. I do see Miss Francesca dropped an awesome point in the chat. Since we're talking and promoting PrEP, we also want to discuss PEP, P-E-P. PEP is short for post-exposure prophylaxis. So that one is kind of like the morning after pill for HIV. If somebody has had a possible exposure to HIV, they can start PEP within 72 hours of that exposure, and it significantly lessens the chance that HIV will, will take hold in their bodies, if you will. And PEP has been shown to have no interactions at all with hormone replacement therapy. It's usually a course of pills for about 28 days or so, sometimes about 30, just to make things easier for dosing. So PEP and PrEP, two awesome, awesome ways to prevent HIV. Both us here at Caracol, here in Cincinnati, in the southwestern corner of the state, were able to navigate folks to PrEP and PEP. And of course, we provide our testing services at Caracol as well. And a lot of times that's working with our awesome medical partners over at Equitas, since they have a clinic here in Cincinnati. Now we're able to provide a lot of referrals for trans healthcare and PrEP healthcare over to our friends and partners at Equitas. That's one of the significant barriers that we see to care, and we, we saw it especially here in Cincinnati for years until Equitas came into town, is that they're, they're just not enough trans competent healthcare providers. For those of you from Cincinnati, you, you may recognize the name Dr. Sarah Pickle. She, she's my personal physician as well. And I often jokingly say that it seems like every transgender person in this city goes to see Dr. Pickle. But now we're, we're lucky enough to have more and more providers coming on board. So in the future, I truly hope that medical schools are going to be better about educating their students on caring for folks that are transgender and some of the different prevention options for folks at risk for HIV. Michaela, did you have anything else to add? Oh, yes, because I've seen what Francesca posted about the uh, poppy and, uh, I mean, the PrEP and PEP. Um, that was a conversation I, I was discussing with um, some people yesterday to where it was, um, to where it was like, there's not, there isn't enough conversation when it comes to PEP. And I think sometimes it's not just for prevention departments, but I think overall medical and even um, emergency rooms. There's not enough discussion and there's not enough advertisement to let people know that PEP is out there and it is a free type of medicine that you can take to help make sure and then also if you get into a situation where there is maybe rape or something where you were sexually abused where you can start that and then you can lead into PrEP. There is a program at Equitas called Poppy, which is a payment assistance program to help people get on PrEP. Um, you just got to... Um, the only criteria is that you have an HIV negative status, you live in Ohio and make less than $62,450. And I do work as a trans health navigator for that program. Um, I wish I did have more trans clients. Um, there's a high percentage of MSM that is on pop, um, PrEP and I'm trying to figure out the best ways to get the trans community to see and understand that there's um, resources out here um, to get more people to use PrEP and even also in the POC community to just get people to understand that there is access. Um, financially, it may not be the um, cheapest thing for many people, but that's what the Poppy program is here to do, to help assist to make sure that you get a zero cost to low cost or no cost at all. Um, but I do believe that there should be more conversation and more advertisements about PEP. Um, and it's just not enough out there to let people know about the pre-things and also the steps that can be taken to be uh, preventive. Goodness gracious. Thank you so much, Michaela. And I, I did see, thank you for dropping this in, in the chat. I believe it was, let me see here, Brooke dropped this in the chat. Poppy is a statewide program. So outside of the areas that Equitas serves here in Cincinnati, Caracol is able to offer the Poppy program. And our partners up in Cleveland, some of the um, some of the organizations up there offer that as well. 
Oh yeah, we cover eleven regions, so we have them. Um, we have them in a lot of the different areas all over Ohio. So there's enough um, health navigators that can be helpful, even in our rural areas, um, to where they're also even making sure that they're linking people to the proper appointments and everything to help and get that care as well. So there's, there's navigation happening all over. <laughs> yes, since I, I come from a very small rural town, uh, I'm very passionate as well about making sure that we we're serving our rural folks. Oh yeah. So with, with all of that said, I think we are going to go ahead and move on to another segment of our presentation today. The main segment of this part of the presentation, Miss Angie will be sharing uh, a deeply personal story, and I, I know I mentioned this earlier with the trigger warning, um, but I do just want to mention that again, since this is a very personal and a, a very emotional story, and we're so, so thankful that Miss Angie is able to share that for, with us. And once Miss Angie has uh, wrapped up her portion of the story, Kim Burroughs from Equality Ohio will be rejoining us again to discuss some of the legal side of things um, as they stand currently in prisons and in the criminal justice system. So I'll turn things over to you, Miss Angie. Hello, hey, I'm Angie. I'm from um, Columbus, Ohio. I'm originally from Cincinnati, Ohio. I've lived in Columbus, Ohio for about 20 years now. Uh, I'm, um, I don't want to call myself totally an activist, but I'm, I'm, I'm being pre presented as an activist nowadays that I've gotten older, but I want to, on the Miss Justice, I, this story that I want to tell you guys, this is actually, I've never shared this story publicly. I've told this story to quite a few friends over the years, but it was always as like a joke. Nowadays, where we're at right now, when I think and I tell this story over now, it's like, I, I just finally, I want to cry. <laughs> but the, I'm, so I'm telling you this personal story, which happened to me, this has actually happened in 1989, which was like 31 years ago. And this was a penal system. I was sent, I was young, uh, I got in trouble and I was sent to the Ohio penal system, which was CRC Correctional in Orrin, Ohio. This was in 1989. Hello? Everything just went away. You're back, Miss Angie. We've got you again. Oh, popping in and out on the video, but your audio was still good. My audio still good? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Well, I guess it'll pop back in this eventually. So this was 18, 1989. I just want to give you the first three days of me, um, young, black, transgender, 20, I was 20, 20 years old. And uh, my first three days, I was very passable. Uh, I had breasts. They was not. They were not ready for that. They were. They hadn't had you know gay people, transgender people, but they they had never experienced one of my category. I guess at that time, so I was very feminine. So my first day there, um, I I got my hair cut. They saved my hair, and they I was only weighed a hundred pounds. So I got a. They gave me a extra small jack jersey. And I was sent to myself. So that night, my first night, I say three, four o'clock in the morning, my cell opens up and there's four guards there. I first thing I see is the three white guards, and then I see the one black. And when I seen the one black guard, I'm like, okay, maybe they're not gonna kill me. Maybe he's not gonna let them kill me. So automatically, before I ever went there, I've heard stories, you know, of what they do to to gay people that go there are, you know, you're automatically going to go to the hole, you're going to be beat or so forth. So automatically I'm saying to my mind, I have to do whatever they say do. So instantly they tore up the cell, they made me get butt naked, stand outside, anybody there, everybody there to look and see me butt naked. Okay, I don't care. I'm going to do whatever you say. Then they marches me across to the, to the, to the, to the, uh, the performity, wherever you get the uniforms and get your hair cut. They made the guy to cut my hair early and they cut my hair over. They told him to cut it where it was shine, you know, so he had to cut it off really bald. And then he gave me this big, extra large uniform to put on. And mind you, I weighed 100 pounds, so I was little. So the only way I could be able to possibly walk was for both of my hands to hold these legs up to walk. So at this time, I can't walk in this, but then the guards are all laughing. They're telling me now, you need to walk like a man because you don't know how to walk like a woman. So they gave me this runway and they told me to walk back and forth. So I done this for a whole hour, holding these things up, bald headed, 
like they wanted me to, to walk like this man. And then finally they takes me back to, no, 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 let me stop. They took pictures. They, the one guard asked, did you get any pictures? And he said, wait, no. They run and get a Polaroid. They had me take off my uniform again. Then they're telling me, hold my breast. They're taking pictures, turn to the side, turn this away, and they're taking pictures. I still can't say nothing. I have to keep the straight face, no smiles, no grins. Back to my cell. I made it got to my cell. Once I was in my cell, I'm like, happy, made it through that. Jesus, I got my life. Three days later, two of the guards come back again. My cell, the guy that was in my cell with me, he was a young guy. They once again take me out, but make me butt naked, parade me around everybody, hundreds of guys, you know. Uh, uh, but then they, my cellmate, they threatened him if he ever looked at me, touched me, or anything, they were going to beat him too. They wouldn't know who he would, his family wouldn't know who he is. So now I have to sit in a cell with someone that's scared of me up in the corner. I'm in the corner and we're in the corner. But only thing that came out the best was that I was only there for two weeks. Thank goodness and that was, that experience was over. But I never really, I never told, I remember telling a person, uh, official back then about it. And, but when she was asking me, who were they? And I said, I couldn't remember their faces, which I did, but you know, I don't know if she was affiliated with them. It was the times, it was 1988, 89. I had to survive. And when I got out years later, when I thought about it, so it was kind of like a joke. I never really got thought like, man, I was, I had to really survive. They were, they totally mistreated me, but it was normal. And I took it as normalcy to what I had to go to as a black young transgender at that time, especially in the 80s. It's so much better now. I'm so happy to be here today to see how life has changed for, you know, the, the community, the marriages, the gay marriages. And that's the wonderful part about it is that I'm here today and able to tell this story. And I hope it can help someone or to know how bad it was and how to change. And maybe Kim can tell you how she could have someone that ever go to any experience or know anyone that is going through experience now. Thank you, I hope y'all enjoyed it. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us, Miss Angie. Um, you know, in my introduction, uh, you all learned that I used to be a prosecutor and I, my man of my eyes been opened the longer I've worked in this field. Um, so when I first heard Ms. Angie's story, I wanted to know what has changed since 1989. What are, what are we doing to stop this? Um, and the answer is a little bit, not enough, and maybe not even as much as we think. Wow. Um, in 2002, uh, US Congress passed a law called the Prison Rape Elimination Act. And it was uh, advocated for by, by some prison rights advocates who wanted to end things like what happened to Miss Angie and what happened to lots of uh, incarcerated individuals all across the country. It took almost 10 years after that law was passed for Congress to implement it. So in 2012, um, the Department of Justice actually finally issued standards um, that were meant to reduce the occurrence of sexual assault in prisons, both by guards perpetrated against uh, prisoners and among prisoners themselves. Um, those standards explicitly require certain screenings. So one of the one of the criteria for screening when somebody is incarcerated is what is their gender um, identity and sexual orientation, gender expression. Do those things make that person more likely to experience sexual assault while they are incarcerated? Things like that. And then based on these screening um, materials, uh, the prison is according to the standards of the program, required to uh, take extra efforts to make sure that, that prisoners are placed in safe situations. Um, unfortunately, this is a voluntary program and uh, many states, uh, the, the only threat to the state if it doesn't comply with this program is a loss of 5% of federal funding for prison programs. So it's not much of a stick. Uh, and if you think about the carrot and the stick, it's, it's a twig um, by federal dollars perspectives. 
um, there was a large spike in reported sexual assaults after those standards were implemented. So in 2011, the year before those standards were, were implemented, there were 8,768 reports of um, sexual assault by, by inmates. Um, by 2015, that number had gone up 180% to 25,661 reports. However, only 8.5% 8, 8 of those reports, the 25,000 reports, were found to be true. Uh, we know that the Department of Justice estimates that um, sexual assault allegations are true between 92 and 98% of the time. So only between 2 and 8% of sexual assault allegations in the general public are, are considered false. And yet in the PREA context, in this, in this statute's context, um, the findings are that 92% of the complaints are false. Um, most, most researchers believe that's not true. There's something wrong here. This system isn't working. Um, a DOJ report in 2012 also found that 42% of the time after somebody made a complaint, they faced retaliation by uh, staff at the prison. Um, 58% of the complaints in 2015, those 25,661 reports, 58% of those were by prisoners against staff members. Um, so these are correctional, this is like what happened to Angie, Miss Angie. Um, these are correctional officers, folks that work, you know, in mess, things like that. Um, and again, uh, there was retaliation 42% of the time. So while, while there are, there is a rec recognition of this problem occurring for um, trans and uh, gay and lesbian uh, prisoners all throughout our country, uh, we're not doing enough. And what we're doing, it's not really working. Um, there's really no evidence to support that these attacks have diminished since this law was passed. We just know a little bit more about them because of these reporting mechanisms. Um, we also have been seeing uh, trouble with our trans clients. So again, I work for Equality Ohio. I'm uh, one of the staff attorneys for our legal clinic. We have uh, three staff attorneys. Our Cleveland-based staff attorney, Kate, um, has a special project where she works with uh, trans clients who are currently incarcerated to help them get uh, HRT and whatever other medical needs that they may, uh, medical treatment that they may need as transgender individuals while they are incarcerated. Um, currently, the barrier there is that uh, entities like the Ohio Attorney General, your local counties that maintain local jails and prisons, state actors are arguing that um, hormone replacement therapy is not a medical need um, under, the, under the Eighth Amendment. And so there are lawyers like us who are trying to litigate that through the courts. But as you know, litigation is something that takes time. And I would estimate that the average case to get to the United States Supreme Court takes between five and six years. Um, thank you, James. So, uh, you know, there are lots of barriers to access to justice and medical treatment um, for trans folks um, and really all folks who, who are incarcerated in Ohio and throughout the country. Um, specifically with regard to COVID-19, um, as many obstacles, barriers, problems we've had securing appropriate health care for our clients um, before COVID-19, those have doubled and tripled since COVID-19 began. Um, in response to, to the virus and to try to keep the spread under control, the Ohio Department of Corrections has been um, creating alternate uh, housing conditions. So they're at Pickaway uh, Correctional Center, there were inmates who were, who were housed in tents outside, like camping tents outside in the yard for some period of time as a, as a quarantine location. Um, that boggles the mind. <laughs> um, uh, PREA, the, the Prison Rape Elimination Act that we discussed earlier, um, that has basically been thrown out the window because the, the department is more concerned with isolating potential infections than they are making sure that uh, prisoners who are at higher risk for sexual experiencing sexual assault while incarcerated are placed with you know people who are at higher risk of perpetrating sexual assault while incarcerated. Um, we have had clients who have been unable to see a specialist for um, HRT or other um, trans-specific medical care for six months. 
Um, so this is all to say the burdens that trans folks, um, queer folks face while incarcerated are numerous and uh, unfortunately they're, they're not changing. <laughs> we're, we're not doing a great job at overcoming those burdens. Um, when you encounter, you know, I know we've got a lot of social workers here. When you encounter clients who are, you know, who have interacted with this system or maybe are still in the system, um, like I like I said, 42% of the time they face retaliation for complaints. These, you know, these folks don't have any reason to trust people who, are, who say they're trying to help them. Miss Angie told us about somebody who was able to help her, a counselor, I believe, um, after those events happened to her. Um, but even there, uh, she wasn't willing to kind of give the names of the faces in fear of retaliation. Um, so these are, the, the layers of trauma here are remarkable, incredible, and uh, it's definitely something that we all need to be aware of to provide trauma-informed care. Uh, Zoe, I think that's about all I have prepared. I know we were going to take some questions at some point. Yes, thank you so much, Kim. I, I keep losing my mute button. I am so sorry about that. So we have had some awesome discussions in the chat so far, and, and thank you, James. Thank you, Kim Welter, for helping us out in the chat so far. So as luck would have it, we do still have about 10 minutes for questions here. Um, I do want to mention to everyone, if you do need to slip out for whatever reason, when you exit the webinar, the link for the CEUs and the quiz will also populate when you exit. The, and I do want to add as well, the CEUs are being generously provided by Caracol, and it may take two to three weeks or so for the CEUs to be fully processed through the board. So I am going to ask for a little bit of help here from you, Kim. Yes, or no problem, Zoe. Some of the questions, since I know we, we've had a great discussion. Yes, and so um, Will asked a question of Francesca, which is, uh, if you don't mind me asking, what else have you experienced negatively with law enforcement? Okay, I would say this, as a trans person, I am more likely not to call law enforcement because I know of the bias. I'm more likely to accept the rape on my body or being stolen from or being harassed and then trying to reach out to someone such as James or Kim at, at Equality Ohio because um, whenever I've called police in the past, I will just get, get, give you an, an incident such as I, I have a neighbor who is dealing drugs and, and we're within two, 200 feet of, of an elementary school. Even though school is closed, I know what he's doing. I've contacted law, law enforcement. And the last time I, I called, I was told, Tranny, we, we don't have time for you. To be calling so it's just a disrespect for from the law enforcement because i'm more concerned about someone's child as we have found needles on the ground on my street walking around we we come out we pick up the needles from his um people who visit him shall we say but um as, as an advocate and as a trans person, even, even as a white trans woman, I am, I am in fear of, of, of calling law, law enforcement because I'm, I'm not sure if that, if, that, if that officer would understand me. And if it's a male officer coming in with his, with his over, overcompensating hyper-masculinity, may may try to rape me as well because we've had cases of that when i lived in charlotte there was a case of of a trans woman who was repeatedly seeing an an officer and then whenever it was found found out found out um and this officer actually murdered her and and went went on trial and was acquitted so as as a trans person be it whether whether you're Caucasian, Latino, a person of color, I think 
we can share a common ground of we we are in fear of of contacting law law enforcement. Are folks aware of the term walking while trans? Basically, what what that means is um, if a trans woman, especially a trans woman of color, is seen walking around downtown, for example, cops will assume that she's a sex worker uh, just because she is readable as as a trans woman. Um, and trans folks are already disproportionately affected by homelessness, food insecurity, um, unemployment. Uh, and when they run into law enforcement, um, especially if you know they happen to have condoms on them, you know, for, for God's sakes, don't carry a condom with you if you're out going on a date. They'll use that as evidence that they're going to be a sex worker. So then trans women to protect themselves stop carrying condoms, which puts them at more risk. Um, for, for being sexually assaulted, for being sexually assaulted um, violently with zero protection, for for getting uh, for being infected with HIV, um, and when they fight back, you know, there's more and more um, the burdens on them to prove that they were in the right when they were in fact the victims, and you know that goes into um, you know really disclosure about your trans status and your HIV status. Some people don't want to disclose either, um, especially when um, you know, there, there is a real risk for physical, um, physical violence, um, you know, and, and even death. Um, so folks will go out of their way to not get tested because they think, you know, they can't be violating the law for knowingly transmit HIV if they don't know their status. And this is true not even with, outside the trans community as well. And the problem with that is obviously, you know, you're increasing your risk, but you know, the, the stigma is still real for, for trans folks out there. So even trans folks who are positive and who are living with HIV, they don't talk amongst themselves because there's so much backlash from different community members and there's so much stigma still um, that we're just not openly talking about this. May I jump in here again? Absolutely. What I will say is as a trans woman living with HIV, what walking while trans, driving while trans, living with HIV, any of those terms, I'm always, I'm very afraid to leave home and not knowing I'm coming back. I have friends who would rather come and get me and have me in their car riding with them than for me to drive to meet them because they, they know of my fear of driving to their house alone or, or whatever, but I, I will say this, and I, I know Miss, Miss, Miss Michaela can back me up on this, but, but my sisters, my daughters of color, those, I, I, I'm always asking them, if you're going somewhere, please tell me when, when you get there, so I know you made it safe, otherwise I'm going to start, start, um, questioning, are you safe? I'm gonna bug your phone. I'm I'm gonna blow blow up someone's phone and say, "Are you safe? Are you home? Ma Mama loves you. Thank Thank God you made it home safe. I I love you. I care. I care about you. Please tell me when you've arrived safely. And I will say, even even with the Black Lives Matter protest and all of that, I support it, but. I was so afraid as a, as a white Caucasian trans woman living with HIV and immunosuppressed in this age of COVID, I spoke with, with, with my care provider and said, I, I want to go. And she said, no, you, and you can't, cannot go because your immune system is compromised and support for, from home, be, be in contact with those you know that, that are down there. Check, check in on them and and have supplies at, at your house and have them get them fr from your house and take them for you. James, do you want to give just real quick a couple of um, good resources for people to do further research, um, information gathering? James, me? Yep, James, yes. you. Okay, um, I would go to transohio.org, um, even though our website is down right now, so I feel silly saying that. Um, we're down, we're, we're expanding our resource list. Um, so we'll be back up by the end of the month. Um, but, you know, Equality Ohio has uh, quite a lot of resource to, resources too. Um, I think uh, 
Kim can speak to this too about um, you know the work around uh, Priya and um, you know the felony convictions. I can't seem to turn my video on. I don't know if anybody. <laughs> We can still hear you, Kim, no worries. Okay, um, yes, yeah, so Equality Ohio will, there we go. Hello. Um, Equality Ohio uh, offers pro bono legal representation to LGBTQ folks who are at or below 300% of the federal poverty limit. Our only exclusions for like subject matter are we don't do criminal defense, which is not the same thing as prison adv ad advocacy. We do prison advocacy. Um, and we don't do lawsuits that involve like high, a lot of money. Um, so we're not, trust me, <laughs> we are not the folks who, who get, you know, $20,000 awards, but we do, you know, landlord tenant stuff. We expunge criminal convictions. We do basically every, anything and everything um, aside from those two exclusions. Um, so if you encounter a client, uh, trans, queer, gay, lesbian, intersex, I've seen a lot of discussion about that. Anybody who identifies as queer, um, and meets that income level, send them our way, um, and we, we do everything we can to make sure we can take on as many cases as we can. Um, so, and if you have a client who you think doesn't meet that income threshold, so, so 2020, 300% of the federal poverty limit is $38,000 a year, roughly. roughly. Um, if you have a client who earns more than that, we do have a referral network. Um, so we have identified some uh, affirming lawyers in our in the three C's, Columbus, Cincinnati, you know, everywhere where we work, um, who can take clients that we're not able to take because of our funding limitations. So please send them our way. Um, I think Kim linked the intake website in here somewhere, but if you just Google Equality Ohio intake, call that number or do an online submission and someone will reach out to you or to the client and we'll go from there. All right. Thanks so much, Kim. We are now after one o'clock. We had some more awesome, awesome questions in the chat. I really wish we could get to those, but unfortunately, since we're over time, so thank you all for being so generous with your time today, both attendees and panelists. Um, one last thing, Kim, Kim Welter did drop the link for the evaluation CEUs in here, but like I said a while ago, when you exit out of the webinar, it will also populate with that link. It'll, it'll show up in your browser immediately. And please do join us for a February webinar. Perfect transition to a topic we're going to be focusing on uh, knowing your rights. We're going to be really focusing on the felony conviction end of things and about how specifically the uh, HIV criminalization laws work here in the state of Ohio. So thank you again all for joining us today. Uh, please do make sure you fill out those evaluations and CEUs if you desire them. That is a huge help to us. And have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.